Okay, I guess we can start. So um, this is, got, I'm just going to take a few minutes and go over the, the design. Uh, you're going to get to come in the lab and build a laser, so it's a lot of fun. Um, but we have to design it first, so that'll be part of the, what I want to go over here. So I've given you the specs. So I've got a, uh, a 5 watt green laser, actually goes up to 15 watts, but we can go up to 5 watts. Last year it didn't work, this year it does, so we're going to make it work. Uh, your goal is to make a 1 watt output power tie sapphire laser. So I've got all the parts, I've got a lot of parts, but I want you to first design it based on what you understand, your first principles. Then you'll come and show me your design, and I'll laugh and throw it back at you, and then we'll fix it, and then you come back. And when you've got a design we all like, then you go up in the lab and build it. So you design it, then you go and you build it. And be done in a group, so you'll go up there. It takes typically, my experience is about two hours, maybe three hours, to get the whole thing from start to finish. There'll be a pile of mirrors, you gotta assemble them, put them together. Critical issues are what are the dimensions, where do you put things, all that kind of stuff. So you need, the, your design has to specify all the, all the curvatures, the dimensions, and all that kind of stuff, so you can quickly put it together. And then, then it turns into just a lot of just alignment. And the, bas the basic issue is you've got, you've got this laser, you've got a cavity which has a laser beam in it. And that beam has is, is, you know, got some axis. Then you've got a pump beam where you're pumping. And then your gain, it might be like this. And so you've got to get your gain and your pump co-located, co-aligned right on top of each other. And that's why aligning takes so long. You just tweak a mirror, adjust it, and you're moving things around. So that's what you'll discover. You know, just a lot of playing around with alignment. But it'll work, and once it, work, once it works, it's a lot of fun. So I want to kind of step you through the process. So it's a tie sapphire. Uh, it'll be a broadly tunable system. It's kind of near infrared. You can see it for the most part. It's kind of a dull red. Um, I've got a handful of mirrors here. Uh, we don't care what kind of cavity you make, although I think you're all going to descend to the same thing. But So you, you can make a ring laser if you want, or a standing wave laser, or a bow tie, or I don't care what you want to do. Come up with a design. Uh, I'll look at each one, and I'll point out the pros and cons of each, why we want to do some stuff. There's a couple things we want to get out of this laser design. One is I want to tune it, so you need one arm which is collimated. So we're going to put what's called a birefringent filter in the laser, and that's just literally a piece of quartz, perfectly flat. You put it at Brewster's angle, and depending on the rotation, it'll transmit one wavelength better than another, so it tunes the laser. That needs a collimated beam to operate, nothing else. So as long as you have a collimated beam, we can just drop this in, Nothing changes and it tunes. So, but I need a collimated beam. So what you can't do is make a laser cavity which is a simple thing like this. This cavity will not work, you know, because that does not have a collimated arm. So a collimated arm is going to require something of the form, you know, like this, you know, or, or ver there are various forms like that. So you've got to have a collimated arm for the tuning. So that's one requirement. Um, let's just go over some of the issues now. So how do you go about designing a laser? So you know all the formulas and stuff, you gotta kinda put it together. And so the key thing to remember is that, uh, and I'll, I'll do it here, we're gonna put some gain here. And so what do you want in that gain? You want a very high intensity, you wanna saturate the gain. So that's why you put a focus in the cavity to concentrate that light down and get a real high intensity. And so, you're going to concentrate, your, your, your design is going to focus around that spot and how much intensity you need and how can you saturate it. Now, how do you start? So, you need a starting point. So, what I like to do is I like to just kind of presume a, a cavity design. Let's say it was this one, even though this is wrong. I've got, I'm going to have an output coupler and I'm going to have a high reflector. And in the specs, I gave you all the parameters. You know, the, just assume the high reflectors have 99.7% reflectivity. The, the, the Brewster angle has, you know, 99.7 transmission, this kind of stuff. So I've given you a pretty good sense of what the losses are in the output coupling. And so I would start with that. Just let's say I did that one. I would say, okay, well, in this one, I'll do a round trip. I know I'm going to have loss, 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 loss in the output coupling. So I can figure out my loss here. And so I know my threshold is going to be 1 over 2L sigma times the log of 1 over R1 t to the fourth R2, right? I know my threshold right away. And uh, this is my, I know all these numbers here. This is all my losses. 
And here's my output coupler, which is to be determined. So as soon as I kind of choose a cavity, I already know what my loss is, but I can estimate it, and I've got to figure out my output coupling. But that's a start. Anyway, you start with your threshold, and because you, the next thing you say is this, this, we have this one formula we know that n of i equals n naught divided by 1 plus i over i sat. Remember that? So with that formula, you're basically home. So when you're lasing, what's, what's n of i? If I'm lasing, could you tell me what the, what, what's, the, what's the inversion when I'm lasing? It's a threshold inversion, yeah. So I know that when I'm lasing, this equals threshold. But I know threshold inversion. It's a number I can compute. So knowing that, I can now make an estimate what kind of unsaturated gain I need. So I need to make an estimate on I over I sat. And so, you know, clearly the higher the intensity, the more efficient my laser is going to be. So what you want to do is kind of look at your designs and choose a couple values. Let's say, well, I've got I over I sat. I'm going to let that be, you know, two, three, four, five. Try a variety of values here, and then compute the rest of your, your, your system based on that. So this is kind of the design parameter I use. How, how far above threshold do I want to be? When I'm at threshold, I equals zero. When I'm at double threshold, I equals I sat, and so forth. To me, a rule of thumb is you want to be in kind of the four to six I sat range inside your gain medium. That, that, that's pretty efficient. Going beyond that, marginal gain. So kind of shoot, you know, look in this zone here. But what does this do? I, I'm just picking a number here. Let's say I choose that's five. I know n naught over, over six equals n threshold. I know n threshold, so now I know what n naught must be. So depending on what I choose here, I can compute what my unsaturated inversion must be. You know, it's going to be 10 to the 19th, 10, whatever it's going to be. It's going to get a number here. Now when I've got this number, what do I do? Well, I know that inside this gain medium, let's look at that rod, I've got this little zone here, which I'm pumping, and it's got an area of pi omega naught squared and a length. And that's the volume of my gain. And I've got to get that kind of inversion in that volume. So how do I do that? Well, I pump it. Now I'm going to bring in some pump power. And I'm going to deposit enough power into that volume to create that inversion. So my, my inversion, you know, my pump rate is just going to be, my rate is just going to be my pump power divided by H nu. Uh, let's assume we're absorbing about 80 or 90 percent of the pump power. Some of it goes through. So I'm going to put a little scale factor here. Maybe I only absorb 85 percent of it. I'm putting it into a volume. I'm putting this much power into that volume. This gives me the de number density times the lifetime. That's, that's the rate, or I mean, this is the rate, <laughs> okay, tau rate. This gives me n naught. So once I, once I figure out what kind of n naught I want, I can say, well, I'm going to pump, say, with 5 watts. I compute all this stuff, I know that. That'll tell me what my volume should be. Once I know my volume, it chooses my spot size. Once I got my spot size, I designed the cavity. Yeah? Where's the 0.85 from? Uh, this is my, uh, what we do is we typically pump, we pump through here, and you absorb, you, you don't want all of your light absorbed in the rod. So here's the, here's the inversion in the rod, and it's going like this, and usually there's about 10, 15% goes through. I could make it darker, but if all the power is absorbed like that, it gets very hot here and nothing there, so it's just to distribute the heat. But the rod we have, we don't have the optimal rod. It absorbs about maybe 80, 85 percent of the green light. It'd be nice if it absorbed a little more, but it doesn't. But, but anyway, that's just a rule of thumb. So, so you want about 90 percent of your power absorbed. It's because you want some transmission. But based on all this kind of nonsense here, you can kind of figure out your spot size. And you're going to find the smaller the spot size, the higher the inversion. So, so you want, that's the reason why we have focus here. A little tiny spot gives you a tiny area, gives me a small volume. 
I'm putting five watts into the small volume, so I have a bigger natural inversion. Bigger inversion means I'm going to have a lot more excess gain, which means I can, you know, I have a higher intensity. So going to small size always helps. And make the smaller you make that spot size, the more efficient your cavity is going to be. The only thing you have to worry about is at some point, the length of this thing has to be greater than 2Z naught. So if you make it too small, of course, there's a minimum. But so play with that number. Just kind of go through the numbers and play with this. But I'm just trying to show there is a there is an actual logical process here. You 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 make an assumption on your losses. That gives you a number for threshold. Then you say, well, I'm going to be five times threshold or whatever. That then gives you a hard number for your inversion. Once you know the inversion you want, and you know your pump power, that tells you how big the spot should be. Then once you know how big the spot should be, then you can start designing your ABCD around the cavity to put that all together. So that's the steps you go through. And you know, you gotta figure out your output coupling. Uh, you can figure out your output coupling based on your excess inversion. You know, there are ways to kind of tie your optimum coupling to this, so you know, it's, it's all, closed form basically if you go through it. Um, so that's that. So I'll, I'll leave you there. You got to discover from there. The last thing is we got to pump this thing. And so you're, let's, let's imagine we got a cavity like this, which you won't have, but I want to pump it here. And so we're going to come in through an end mirror because we want to pump this collinearly. This is a one centimeter. So we got to really pump these things identically. So we pump through the end mirror. And so this mirror is dichroic. It reflects at 800 nanometers, and it transmits at 532. So the green light goes through pretty nicely. Okay, so that's easy. But this acts like a negative lens. And what you want to do, let's, let's, if, if, my, if my cavity mode looks like that, I want my pump beam to be that or smaller. So I want my pump beam to match that as close as I possibly can. I don't want to pump out here. I want to pump in there. So part of your challenge is to take this green beam and, and do some sort of focusing where when it comes in, it travels, it hits this negative lens, and then goes through there. And how do I compute the negative lens? Well, you're gonna do that. Let's say you choose, I want a R equals 10 centimeter mirror here. So you know this is 10 centimeter, and that's flat, and you can assume this is three millimeters, it doesn't really matter. But you can compute what the effective focal length of it is using ABCD. So you've got to take your beam, you assume, it's, assume you have a nice Gaussian planar wavefront out here. That's a pretty good approximation. You're going to put a lens in somewhere and focus it down and go through there so that when it gets to your, your gain medium, it perfectly matches. And honest to God, this is where the real art, this is where the power comes in. When you do this right, you get a lot of power. When you do it wrong, it doesn't laze at all. So uh, we'll look at that pretty carefully. But think about how you do that. And I'll, I'll try, I've got to measure the green beam. I've got to give you some parameters. So if you don't know what omega naught is here, you're not going to be able to compute anything. So I'll try and give a number for that in the next day or two. So you can compute, here's my green beam with a certain spot size here. I want to get it to my, my desired value, which I got from here. And so how do I create that optical system to do it? And so what we'll have in the lab is we'll have all these mounts. We'll have We'll have this lens, it'll be on a translation stage, so you can move it in and out, and get it positioned well. I'll have a bunch of lenses, so any lens you want, we probably have. I don't have too many of these, but I'll I gave you some numbers to play with. See what you come up with, and then I'll kind of gently guide you toward what I have toward the end, but I'll let you play initially. And then um, what else do we need? I think that's basically it. Oh, okay, then. Then the fun. So you're in the lab, you get it working, and you got it lasing. This is going to be great. Uh, people usually get it lasing. We, getting a watt is not unusual. So we can get it one watt out of this thing. It's really fun. If we have time, we're going to try and mode lock it. So we're going to try and make picosecond or femtosecond pulses. And we do that with a satchel absorber. Now, the way the satchel absorber works is it, um, it's a mirror. So it's got a, it's got a Bragg reflector here. And then it's got a quantum well in front of it. And light comes in and saturates the quantum well, and then reflects and comes back out. So it's a mirror which has a saturable loss on it. And the trick is you've got to focus this down pretty tight on that thing to make it saturate. So we just can't take the end mirror and replace it. We've got to, we've got to put it at focus. So I, this is where we're going to see how this works. I would like in your design, if, 
if you've got at least a collimated arm which ends on a high reflector, a flat mirror. And what we'll do is we will replace that with a curved mirror and put a focus and put the satchel absorber right there. So once you've had your fun, you've got this thing lazing and everything's happy with it, we'll replace one of the high reflectors with a curved mirror, create a focus, and put that down and try and focus. And this works pretty well. This is basically collimated. So let's say we put a curved mirror here. We know this distance is gonna be basically the focal length. So we just put that at the focal length distance. We'll put on translation stage and see if we can get it to work. I don't know how hard it'll be, but if it, it should be, you know, if we get in the right spot, it'll mode lock like that, and we'll see if we can get some characterization. You can see the picosecond pulses, and and what a thrill! You know, we'll see if it works. So that's the game. So to get, if you want to do this, we're going to need one of your arms terminating on a high reflector with a flat mirror. And then we can just drop in the curved mirror and give it a shot. I think that'll take about 20 minutes to get that working. So let's we'll see how that works. So that's the goal. So this would be the bonus. We've never done femtosecond pulses in the lab. It'd be a lot of fun if it works. But everything else you should be able to do it. Um, I'll be around a lot. So uh, come see me. Come stop by my lab any, or my office anytime. I'd be happy to. What I want to do is meet every group and go over your design. So before you go in the lab, I've got to see your design and review it. And when it looks good, We'll set up a time and go. And we'll do this anytime next week or the week after, uh, sometime before finals, you know. <laughs> We've got to get it done sometime. But just count on spending an afternoon or a morning in the lab. Take about three hours as a group, and we'll get it rolling. Any questions? Okay, so this is, this is hard to do the first time. You're gonna, putting all this together, I kind of stepped you through it. Just try and, try to understand it. Try and go through it. It all is fairly logical once you start stepping through, everything is closed form. So you can come up with a hard number. You're not making any estimates on this. You can say, okay, I want my ISAT to be four times four ISATs, and it'll come up with a number. You can compute the optimum coupling. You can compute the spot size and everything. So all this thing should be computable. If you can't get there, come see me, and I'll, I'll carry it from there. All right? Okay, this ought to be fun. And ask questions anytime. Right, so for the uh, for the lab that uh, Cliff just mentioned, um, first of all, I think it, you will enjoy doing it because if uh, uh, this really brings together everything we have done in the course uh, from the very beginning, you know, ABCD parameters, uh, gain saturation, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and uh, this time you are going to build it yourself. And so the plan is, um, I uh, actually over. The week I'll send out an email for signups again for next week for times and but before that, as Cliff suggested, uh, uh, you could either keep the same group that you uh, did the first lab with and uh, it'll be done in a group again and you can sit down together, perhaps go through the design and uh, come up with some numbers and go meet Cliff. Uh, he said he'll be uh, around pretty much all of next week, so you can go and catch him and discuss your design with him. And then uh, si uh, we'll have a few time slots available. You sign up for a, uh, it'll be probably two and a half hours or three hours, as he said, depends on how long it'll take. Uh, and you go in and build it. Okay. So that's the plan at this point for the second lab. Yeah. So, uh, <coughs> okay, good. Uh, what I uh, wanted to do, so I think uh, all but one group has uh, finished the first lab and, uh, and uh, uh, I think the last group is tonight at, uh, or this evening at 5 p.m. And uh, what I want to do uh, for uh, the next uh, half hour today is, is to um, uh, kind of summarize what you have uh, seen uh, perhaps in the uh, first lab, uh, semiconductor laser diode, its output characteristics. But what I want to do today is uh, uh, kind of not go into the 
into the microscopic details, but look at it uh, somewhat from a more phenomenological perspective, meaning uh, um, if you are actually a user of a semiconductor laser diode, uh, what are the parameters that are of interest to you and, and you know, such things. Uh, uh, and we'll see that we can actually say quite a bit without, uh, now that we know some of the microscopic details, that's great, but even if you didn't know the microscopic details, you could say quite a bit about how a laser would, uh, 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 should perform uh, uh, and, and we will um, then uh, uh, use that phenomenological model to say how fast can I turn a semiconductor or modulate a semiconductor laser diode when it's lasing. You know, is there some frequency limits or speed limits to how fast I can uh, make the light, uh, uh, you know, brighter or, um, uh, you know, dimmer and so on. Uh, but before I go there, I know I, I uh, uh, discussed uh, uh, the uh, microscopic details of the gain in the last class in quantized structures. We talked a bit about quantum wells and uh, uh, so uh, ju just as a uh, summary in your book uh, there are uh, so here's a, an example of a quantum well structure that's used uh, uh, in, a, in a, a laser diode. So here you have aluminum gallium arsenide of different compositions 85 percent aluminum gallium aluminum composition large band gap slightly smaller band gap and finally your quantum well here it's a rectangular quantum well with your quantized states in it and those are your uh, you know based on this you can get your density of states as one step this is your optical joint density of states and then you get another step if you go to the second value uh, uh, one of the points here is the electrons are confined in the quantum well and holes or empty states in the valence band here in the quantum well but photons are not. Photons are kind of spread out uh, and because the refractive index of this region is larger than the refractive index of that region, uh, this is a smaller band gap so it has a higher refractive index. It tries to confine the light. So the light profile or the mode of the light, so electron modes are confined here but the light goes like that. It spreads out a bit more. And uh, this is, uh, uh, well, this, so, so there will be some decay and then this particular structure is, will be called a cladding layer, you know, this, this thickness. That is essentially a quantum well for light. That, that, that's a quantum well for light effectively for you. Whereas this is a quantum well for electrons. And the, the, uh, the volume ratio of uh, the light uh, or, or the electrons to the light is what's called this gamma factor. And I wanted to, the, the big gamma factor um, again in pictures, so the point was that the gain is actually obtained inside the quantum well where you get inversion and such things and uh, uh, but, but uh, uh, the light I is all around so only the photons that are confined in this little strip get, uh, get stimulated uh, emission and gain. The photons that are outside really do not uh, see the gain uh, and, and so the, uh, if, I'm, if my net gain of the quantum well is gamma naught at a certain frequency uh, and this ratio of the quantum well, say the thickness of the quantum well, divided by the th thickness of this, you know, entire spread maybe uh, uh, outside. So this over volume of photons. So this would be volume for electrons divided by volume of photon. That's what's gamma. Uh, and one way to look at it is the light is an electromagnetic wave with a certain electric field amplitude. So square of the amplitude is the intensity of light, which is proportional to the number of photons. So you, if you want to find what is the net volume uh, of uh, photons that are, uh, <coughs> you know, uh, uh, that are inside the quantum well, what you do is, uh, so you're, you're looking at intensity variation and you're just integrating it within the quantum well, divided by over all of space, meaning outside the quantum well as well. And that's, that's really the, your uh, uh, modal uh, factor here or the volume factor and the net gain that you actually can get is not the total gain because of the quantum well which you have calculated earlier but uh, it is gamma times this net gain so, because only this fraction of photons are seeing the gain so, so that's the gain that you actually get in a, semi uh, in a quantized structure and so that was the a bit of a trade-off I was mentioning earlier. So we're using quantum wells or quantum wires or such things, you can really increase the gain in that volume, but the volume is small. So, so the net gain you have to play such that, you know, when you, you, you're losing 
the net volume, but you are getting, you know, this you can increase, but this you're losing, so there's a trade-off between the two. So, so that's, that's something I wanted to point out. Uh, uh, if you do some research in lasers or building lasers, uh, there's a lot of, uh, uh, oh, basically this is the basic, uh, this is the main idea, but there's a lot further, you know, you can go ahead and design an array of dots or an array of wires. Uh, most of the conventional uh, lasers in market today, uh, semiconductor lasers in market today, use quantum wells. And typically there would be two or three quantum wells. And you try to shape the uh, photon field or the light field such that the maxima of these really intersect with the quantum wells. It's important that you, know, you get the maximum gain possible. You know? So, so does that make sense? I mean, you, you, you want it to be, uh, so, so if your quantum well was sitting somewhere in the tail of the light field, that's not good. So, so you want it to be at the middle where the intensity is the maximum and, and the most number of photons are seeing that gain. So, yeah. uh, okay, so, uh, and I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, quite a few different structures. Uh, nowadays, one can grow these uh, materials with uh, extreme precision down to you know, lattice constants, uh, monolayer thicknesses, uh, and, and that's again, that's played uh, in, in, in making many of these laser devices, you know. So uh, techniques of epitaxy, like molecular beam epitaxy, or uh, chemical vapor deposition, they are used to grow these materials. Uh, I think he here's an example of some of the structures that uh, are, we are looking at in our lab, uh, where we control two or three monolayers of quantum well thicknesses to design the quantized states and so on to get gain and LED and hopefully lasing in uh, ultra short, uh, very short wavelength lasers. Uh, okay, so uh, I'll actually, uh, what I'll do next is uh, talk about something that you saw in your lab and those who haven't, uh, we're gonna see it uh, this evening. So essentially, if you make a plot, uh, this is your uh, problem one of your, uh, of your, uh, uh, of your lab work. You, if you make a plot of the output power of a semiconductor laser as a function of the injected current, uh, so, so we are going to see, uh, or, or what you have seen if you have already plotted, is, is uh, as I inject current into the semiconductor laser diode. So here's, the, uh, in pictorially, the semiconductor laser diode, which is, has some quantum wells in the middle. And you have your P region, N region contacts, and you're injecting a certain amount of current by a, using a battery. Right, so the current flows in there. And, and what's coming out is the uh, output power of the laser with a certain mode shape and all that. So we are looking at this output power or P out in milliwatts. Uh, uh, does anyone remember how much milliwatts were you getting in this laser in the lab? Those who were in the lab, that is, yeah. So it, this was a few milliwatts, like three milliwatts or something like that, at the, when, you're, when you're injecting about, uh, I forget, 20 milliamps of current or something like that, right? So, uh, and below that you could see all the cavity modes uh, before it started uh, getting into the lasing, uh, uh, you know, uh, mode. But uh, so if you plot this, P out versus I, uh, which is the injection current into the diode, uh, uh, what happens is initially you see that it, it kind of is, is a very slow increase uh, till you reach the threshold and then the increase is very sharp. So the output power is sharp. And uh, the other very characteristic thing is till you reach this, this threshold, uh, it's actually not lasing, it's a spontaneous emission. It's in a LED mode, light emitting diode mode. So, so it's not yet lasing. Uh, you have cavity modes and you see all the uh, FSR picture in there. Uh, uh, but once it starts lasing, you see there's a huge amount of narrowing of the spectrum and it kind of get uh, to one mode and, and the output power increases here. So, so uh, uh, physically what happens, and we're going to kind of uh, build a very phenomenological model around it today uh, in the uh, remaining time. So till here, you have spontaneous emission and for currents larger than the threshold current, you still have spontaneous emission. Spontaneous emission is always the background or the noise in a laser. You still have spontaneous emission, but what happens really is the spontaneous emission, amount of spontaneous emission output power really clamps here. It doesn't increase anymore. It just you know, clamps at this point. It doesn't increase anymore, so that would be your P spontaneous, if you might. 
and all the extra current that you're injecting beyond the threshold is going into stimulated emission. So you know everything out here is uh, stimulated emission. That's a useful laser output power. So, uh, and uh, therefore, uh, there is, it's in our best interest to do two things really, to lower the threshold current as much as possible and to make this as sharp as possible because you want as much output power for any amount of injected current. That's really, as an engineering, as an engineer, this is something you'd li love to have. Right? To, and, and therefore, this, uh, uh, the slope aspect of it is parameterized by this quantity, which, well, we just call it the slope. And what we'll see is, uh, you know, if I look at delta P over delta I here, this ratio of the slopes uh, uh, is called the differential uh, quantum efficiency, just like a resistance, for example. Uh, it's an IV, IV characteristic. It's called the uh, differential quantum efficiency, which will be delta P out over delta I, but not here, above threshold. Above threshold when you uh, have stimulated emission. And uh, um, <coughs> Uh, wh what I want to do in the uh, next few minutes is to kind of write down an expression for, for uh, primarily this part of the uh, laser. And what we'll see uh, uh, now is P out, just based on this uh, uh, you know, sort of picture I can write, that P out is equal to the current minus a certain threshold current right, in this part of the window. Uh, and P out is a power, so there must be some voltage sitting here. Voltage times current is power, right? There must be some voltage sitting here. And what is a very characteristic voltage in this picture? And what is a characteristic voltage? So well, I have a diode, I'm, you know, I'm applying some voltage here, but there's also photons, right? And photons have a characteristic energy, right? The photon that's coming out here with a photon energy of H nu, if I take H nu, which is the photon energy, and I divide it by electron charge, that's a characteristic voltage, and that's what goes there. So each photon, how much voltage is coming out. And <coughs> so here you can kind of uh, at least phenomenologically see what, uh, what I'm trying to do. I'm saying that for every electron that I'm pumping in, I'm getting a photon out. But that's not going to happen. There's a certain amount of efficiency to that. Right? And that efficiency is exactly the differential quantum efficiency here. So your net output power of a laser is going to look something like this from a phenomenological model without much regard to the details of the internal physics. Right? Uh, uh, so that's a, uh, uh, and then when you actually do the measurement, you can actually get all these quantities. Well, photon energy, get from spectrum, current you're measuring, know the threshold. So this whatever sits out here is a differential quantum efficiency. So that's one uh, uh, important thing. But we also know that that's not exactly right because there's always a little spontaneous emission coming out as well. That's the background. So what I wrote is just the stimulated emission. So you can add that back in uh, as a background spontaneous emission as the net power output out of which this part is coherent and it's a laser that is incoherent and it's a LED. So, so, so that's. Uh, and below threshold, you just have a spontaneous emission, which will uh, uh, be below threshold here. I get just a spontaneous emission. But here, the spontaneous emission is actually proportional to the current. Once you go above threshold, it's not proportional anymore. It clamps and it's a constant. It doesn't increase anymore. Does that make sense? That's the that's uh, uh, nature of the output power of, of, of the laser. And so what we want to do now is kind of build that up. And uh, 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 once we are able to write down the, uh, some more microscopic details of it, we'll see that uh, what we'll be interested in is I, what I want to do in a semiconductor laser diode, which is used for communication systems to design you know, uh, data rate transfer, high speed data rate transfer. What you do is you park your current, your, your you know, current is somewhere out here, but then you start, you know, uh, feeding in a current which is not a constant, it's above threshold, but the current is some DC value plus some I1 e to the power j omega t, so it's an AC current now, not a D DC current, but an AC current. You can start modulating the cu current, input current, at a certain frequency. And as I swing the current, the output power is going to swing as well. Right? 
the amount of light that's going to come out is going to swing because you're, you're sitting at that point. And we'll see that the output power, <coughs> or, yeah, out is also going to be a, f uh, uh, so this is a function of the frequency at which you're swinging it, uh, swinging the uh, current. Remember, this frequency has nothing to do with the light frequency. I mean, this light frequency is 100 terahertz. This is, you, you want to uh, change the, uh, you want to have a data rate transfer of a 1 gigahertz, then omega is 1 gigahertz. Right? Yeah. Does that make sense? It's, it's the rate at which you're changing your current. And this will try to respond. The output power of the laser is going to try to respond at, a certain, uh, at the same frequency. And what we'll find then is P out as a function of the frequency at which you're changing your input divided by uh, the input current. And I'm looking primarily at small signal, meaning I don't really care much about the DC value I'm sitting at, but really how much amplification or uh, whether the output power is able to follow this small AC, AC part. Right? So what I will do now is P out as a function of I omega. And we'll find out how, uh, what is the frequency response of this diode, you know, of this laser diode. Uh, meaning if I want to have data rate transfer at you know, 200 gigahertz or 200 gigabits per second, then omega here would be 200, you know, omega is 2 pi times f. Right? So that if that's two, uh, 200 gigahertz or 40 gigahertz, whichever way you want to, uh, whichever speed you want, can the laser actually follow? That's the question we, we want to ask. Beyond a certain frequency, the laser will not be able to follow the input rate. It will be too fast for it. And what we'll see here is uh, 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 this will, <coughs> let me, uh, so, so what we'll uh, look at, look at the final result is, is that it's, it's going to have a certain frequency response. And I just want to write that down first. And we get there in the next uh, few minutes. Time some time constants out here. So uh, we are going to uh, look at that part right now. So as a, as a, uh, just to relate to this, so this is a frequency response. And that's the DC response. Output power as a function of a DC current is this. But output power as a function of the AC current is still kind of that. But there is, as you increase the frequency, the output power is going down now. It's you know it's if something is uh, sitting in the denominator, and you know any sort of circuit analysis and all that. You know if you have done RLC circuits, this is your uh, you know speed at which uh, uh, you can drive a circuit, whether it's resonant or not. And what we'll see is the output characteristics is kind of interesting. There are uh, there is a resonance at a certain frequency. So output power actually increases at a certain frequency, and then it decays uh, as you go above us, uh, you know, uh, that frequency at a 40 dB per decade. You know, so, so. And uh, you can increase or decrease that cutoff frequency of a laser, uh, which is typically in the tens of gigahertz. These days, you can get up to about 60, I think, 60 gigabit per second. That's how fast you can you know, kind of uh, turn the current or modulate the current, and the output will follow at that frequency. You know. And, and uh, uh, we're going to just see that today. So uh, and I, I just want to start by saying that this is a phenomenological model. So it's a very simple model, very simple model, and uh, with uh, two rate equations. You know, and then the picture is uh, here. This is from uh, a book that is dedicated to semiconductor lasers, not all kinds of lasers, uh, from a Coldren's, uh, Coldren, Korsen, and Masanovich book. But it's a nice analogy. Essentially, what we are doing is we are trying to fill our active region with electrons. Or, and holes. And uh, the rate at which we are filling it is proportional to the current. So the current that's uh, bringing in the carriers. And we are trying to fill up the carriers in the bands. right? But we know that there is a certain threshold criteria for lasing. Right? You have to fill it up to a certain level. If you go above that level, you're going to lase. If you're below that, you'll only have spontaneous emission. Right? So, so that's the picture uh, that uh, we inject carriers. But some of them, I lose to photons, but as spontaneous emission. Some of them, I'm, perhaps there are defects in the material or other losses. So if I have mirror losses, et cetera, or you know, I'm losing over there. If I have losses which are non-radiative electrons, inst instead of recombining to give you photons, are giving you heat because they're colliding with the lattice of the semiconductor and causing vibrations. So those are uh, all the loss terms. 
uh, and this is the input term and at steady state the net input must be equal to the net output. That's, that's the picture here and for that I can write down an equation uh, uh, or, the, or a rate equation. I can say that if I'm trying to fill my active region of the semiconductor with electrons and here we are going to assume that N and P are exactly equal. If I'm trying to fill it with electrons then I have a certain generation rate of electrons minus a certain recombination rate of electrons you know rate at which I'm generating minus the rate at which I'm losing them. Right? What is the net recombination rate? If I have spontaneous emission each electron and whole pair recombine to give me a photon so that would give me a spontaneous emission that's one rate but then there's another channel which is due to some losses maybe leakage where electrons go through the diode to the other terminal and do not really give you any electron uh, any photon that's kind of a leakage so I can phenomenologically account for that by saying there's a certain rate for leakage I can say that there's certain amount of non-radiative recombination. So these are all possibilities that uh, will lead to recombination. And of high interest though is once your rate of injection is large enough and you have filled up. So you can imagine if you have a faucet like that and you're filling it, you fill up to a certain level. That's steady state now, right? But now you increase your flow and the level here rises further, right? And at a certain point, you are going to reach the threshold and it's going to leak out uh, from the side now. And that's the useful output power. That's stimulated emission now. Does that make sense? That's the way we are modeling it as, as a phenomenological property. So you do have a stimulated emission part and that's our useful output and that's also a recombination. But all the generation is occurring because of your injection current. And it is equal to the net current injected divided by the volume uh, or, or you know, we'll, if you are looking at number of electrons, is current over charge is the number of electrons divided by the volume uh, over which you are injecting it. I'm going to just write the volume here. And uh, uh, so, so that's that's roughly my generation rate. Uh, typically, in semiconductor lasers, you add in a little extra another term here, which is called an injection efficiency of carriers, because not all carriers may make it to your active region. Not all carriers. So you add in this phenomenological term that accounts for all the carriers that never made it to the active region at all, but reflected or did something like that before you reach your active region of the, di of the laser diode. So that's really your total uh, rate equation for electrons or carriers. That's your source term, if you might, of uh, that's going to lead to photons. Now, all the loss terms, these are your loss terms here. Uh, you can kind of combine all of them and say that all of this is equal to a, my carrier density over a certain lifetime uh, uh, of, of carriers. This is an assumption, but experimentally this proves to be very accurate. That, uh, that all the losses combined is equal to the carrier density divided by a certain lifetime of the carriers. So let me see what your, uh, I think what it's written here is tau sub s. If you want to go into further more details, uh, typically uh, this is uh, uh, spontaneous emission is proportional to uh, B times N squared. This is a detail which we don't want to get into, but because spontaneous emission uh, requires uh, both electrons and holes, uh, so you got a, a, a square, or bi, bi, it's called a bimolecular process. Uh, Non-radiative recombination typically goes as a some constant times just the carrier density and then there's another non-radiative process called OJ, which requires three particles, one electron, two holes, or two, two electrons, one hole. That's some of the more details of this quantity, but we are not, not going into all those details at this point. Uh, what happens is around any bias point, you are only changing it by, uh, the carrier density is by a very small amount, so it's very reasonable to assume that's proportional to the carrier density, not, not as a square or a cube and all that. And then you have the stimulated emission here, and uh, the stimulated emission uh, rate, uh, so th these are all rates with units of one over centimeter cube second. So one over centimeter cube second, and you can check all of these. This, you know, it's current, volume, charge, and efficiency, and the rates here must have this same, same units. 
So the stimulated emission part is really the useful part for us. And, and uh, th this part I can write now that I need to have a certain threshold of carrier density to, to uh, uh, cause stimulated emission. And this is what is necessary to overcome all the losses, uh, mirror losses, internal losses in the gain medium, et cetera, reflections. Uh, and uh, uh, so here it's written as n minus n uh, this, this term co is called transparency, which is uh, effectively this carrier density is what is related to the threshold re uh, of current needed for the laser. Now, I'm, uh, and at this point, uh, I'm going to, uh, in, in your book also, I mean, the way it's written is you just put in a constant in front and say that uh, uh, I can go into the, delve into the microscopic details and figure out what is this constant based on the gain of the medium and all that sort of thing. At this point, we're not going to get, get, uh, get into the details there. But one difference between these terms, which are our, our spontaneous emission term and the stimulated emission term, is the sp stimulated emission term needs photons to get going. It, it, it needs, uh, you know, uh, and therefore, the, it's also proportional to amount of power, or number of photons, if you might, or the power in the, in the, uh, carried by the photons uh, in, in, in the laser. So this, this power would be the photon energy times, uh, you know, a certain lifetime. It could be the photon lifetime or something of that sort. I don't want to get into that exact details of what that is, but so this will be, uh, the power is proportional to the photon en energy times some lifetime times the number of photons in the cavity. So that's the out power of in, uh, the laser output power, you know, in milliwatts if you might, if, if you are at that stage. You know, so. Whereas the spontaneous emission doesn't, is not proportional to the photon density. You know, it, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't depend on it. Okay. So, so your net rate equation for electrons looks like this. You know, essentially, uh, if, you, if you divide the current by the cross-sectional area, you get J over D. I o. So volume can be written as cross-sectional area times the thickness of the active region. I over this will be J. And uh, sorry, electron charge I've written as E, but it's actually e. electron charge is E. This efficiency is not included in your book, but I just put it in in case, I mean, uh, uh, you uh, uh, in real laser diodes, there is a you know eighty to ninety percent injection efficiency, so I put it in here. You know, so. so, so that's the rate equation for electrons. Now, uh, w whatever is lost, all the electrons that you lose to spontaneous emission appears as a gain. I mean, this is what all the photons that are generated by stimulated emission. So now, if you want to write, uh, so this is my rate equation for electrons. And I have a rate, similar rate equation for photons. And photon, I'm writing it as output power as a function of time. The rate equation for photons. Uh, now, whatever I've lost by stimulated emission here, I'm going to gain there. So instead of a, sorry, I think I should have written here. So minus and there's minus. So I'm losing electrons every time I cause a spontaneous uh, uh, or a stimulated emission. I'm, I'm losing el uh, electrons, whereas I'm gaining photons. So I have that same term really appear here as a gain term, meaning that's my generation term for the photons. I'm also generating photons by spontaneous emission. Spontaneous emission part is also generating photons. So uh, I'm also generating photons by spontaneous emission. Now there is a beta factor here, which again is related to microscopic details, and we are not uh, discussing this at this point. Uh, and the third term is uh, every photon I generate in the cavity, I'm going to lose it at some point, uh, you know, I mean, uh, because that's my output power of the laser. And so they reside inside the cavity for the photon lifetime, so I am losing them at this rate. Every photon I generate, losing them, uh, th this is how long it stays in the cavity. So that's your rate equation for photons, or uh, power output of the photons. Again, you see this is a phenomenological model, uh, and all the details of you know, your uh, gain spectrum, gamma naught of nu, uh, and all that are buried inside this term here. They're all buried inside there. So, so, and then they appear as some numbers. But these two other rate equations, and one needs to kind of solve them, 
to get your output power versus current injection. And you, if you take these both rate equations to you know, steady state, d by dt is at zero, you can solve them self-consistently, ends, and you get output power is equal to what we just wrote uh, in the last. So, so from there, you get this expression right away. And then uh, uh, you say that uh, now instead of a DC current, I'm going to use an AC current. So you say my J is J naught, which is DC plus a certain oscillatory current, e to the power j omega t with you know, this delta. And as a result, the output power, the car electron density, all of them are start going to oscillate with that time. So you feed them in, into this equation, into these two rate equations, you know, J naught plus e to the power j omega t times that. Uh, and what you get is output power divided by the input current is going to look like this now. You know. So here's your photon energy, differential quantum efficiency, and here's your d decay product. Does that make sense? I mean, this is from a purely phenomenological model. And what you re recover from it right away is what is the frequency response of output car power of a laser to the input current of the laser. And this resonance frequency, or the resonant frequency, will be related to the photon lifetime. Omega squared would be proportional to photon lifetime and the spontaneous emission lifetime and the output power. Now, this is what you get by solving it. I'm not doing it in the class, but it's a few lines of, uh, uh, you know, and it's done in your book, so please uh, read through that. And when you plot this function as a function of frequency, you see this is, so this is uh, essentially how fast you can modulate a semiconductor laser diode from the phenomenological model. Now, uh, so okay, we, what we'll do is uh, uh, we'll, we can stop here today and uh, um, we don't have class the rest of the week, uh, Thanksgiving break. And um, what I, I have two office hours today, one from 11.30 till 12.30, and another from 6 to 7, I think. I think so. And both are in Philips uh, 228B. And assignments are due, uh, uh, I think some of you asked, where do you turn them in? So please keep them in the mailbox right outside um, Philips 426. Just, just, uh, you know, and there's a mailbox, so you can keep them there. And uh, uh, okay, so essentially this kind of completes uh, what we discussed today, completes this chapter 11 in the book, uh, you know, uh, about semiconductor lasers. And uh, uh, I will actually email out what's the plan for the next, uh, I think we have three more classes uh, after the break. I'll, uh, and one of the major parts for the rest of the class is you got to design your laser and build your laser. Right? And, um, and the last assignment would be primarily building that laser, but there may be one or two more questions about, about what we have covered today and uh, we'll, we might cover in the next week. Okay, good. So I'll see you uh, come over the office house.